So last time we started to learn about uh, metamaterials. And uh, as I said earlier, metamaterial is basically a nanostructure that is smaller than the wave wavelengths of light so that uh, uh, you can basically uh, create an electromagnetic response uh, by using this artificial structure. And as, an, as a first example, uh, I talked about a layered structure, like planar layered structure uh, of alternating layers of epsilon A and epsilon B. And then what we realized was that in this layered structure, the permittivity along, effective permittivity along one direction and the other direction are different. And uh, it can even have a different sign as I, as I saw here, as, I, uh, as we saw here. So that uh, if the permittivity of, uh, in, in two directions have different signs, then we call this as a hyperbolic metamaterials because their um, isofrequency surface uh, has a, hy a hyperbolic shape. And the reason why this is important is because uh, if you have a hyperbolic dispersion like this, uh, you basically can access arbitrarily large k vector, right? Arbitrarily large k vector, uh, so that uh, the uh, resolution limit, the diffraction limit, can be removed. And as I I already uh, explained this, but like in a typical material, in a in a normal material here. Uh, the isofrequency surface is uh, circular, right? Uh, with a maximum value to be uh, nk0. So that uh, the maximum k vector uh, that a uh, propagating light can have is nk0, and, and that's it, plus minus nk0. So that, uh, and, and with these k vectors, you cannot describe a, a fine feature, right? smaller than the lambda over two. And then that constraint can be removed here. Again, like if you have a, a hyperbolic metamaterial, then uh, it, you know, the upper bound of the K vector is basically removed so that uh, your resolution can be greatly enhanced. So that's the point of hyperlens. And then uh, another uh, interesting thing about the, um, the, the hyperbolic metamaterials is that you can create a negative refraction. So uh, here uh, you show the interface between regular material, which has a uh, isofrequency surface that looks like circular. And then here at the bottom, you have a hyperbolic metamaterial so that uh, your uh, uh, isofrequency surface becomes hyperbolic, right? And then what you uh, what we know uh, is that from the uh, momentum conservation law, if this is an input wave, then the reflected uh, the k vector of the reflect reflected light should have the same in plane k vector, right? Uh, to the incident light. That's the momentum conservation. And similarly, also the reflect I mean transmitted light also have the same in-plane k-vector. So the relation between uh, ki, kr, kt are determined by the uh, in-plane momentum conservation. Okay, so if incident, uh, incident vector has this uh, k-vector, reflected vector has this k-vector, and then transmitted uh, light has this k-vector, then uh, you can estimate the propagation direction of light by uh, uh, just taking the normal vector of the EQ uh, isofrequency surface. Because as I said, group velocity is, uh, or group velocity is basically a gradient of uh, omega so that uh, if you have an isofrequency surface, the gradient of isofrequency surface, I mean, omega must be 
perpendicular or normal to the isofrequency uh, surface. So like in this case, in, in the uh, regular uh, light, regular material, the, the direction of the K vector and the direction of the uh, group velocity are the same, right? Because they kind of, you know, if you have a circle, then uh, this, you know, the direction of the K vector and the surface normal direction are basically the same. That's the property of circle. But uh, if you have a hyperbola, like in this figure, then uh, what happens is that at this point, the uh, surface normal direction is given here, right? So that uh, if you actually have a material boundary between regular material and the hyperbolic material, you can see the incident light and transmitted light has this form. Looks pretty, uh, you know, basic, very confusing form. It's, it's a negative refraction coming, coming in like this, but going out like that. It's a, uh, this is called negative refraction. But one interesting thing here is that uh, if you look at the free space light, the wave front and the propagation direction are basically uh, perpendicular. But here, the wave front looks like it's going this way, like along the K vector, whereas the, the light is actually propagating in that way. So that in, in this case, uh, it, you know, this wave has very weird looking uh, phase advance. All right, so now let's move on to the uh, magnetic response. So far, I'm talking only about the electric response of a, of a metamaterial, but uh, magnetic response is probably uh, what's more challenging uh, in, in, in this field. So in order to see uh, what is actually happening in a real material, here you have a nucleus and you have a electron orbiting around the nucleus. And then there are two types of, uh, two types of uh, magnetic uh, dipoles, magnetic moments. The first one is what, it, what we call like orbital angular momentum, like due to this orbiting motion of uh, electrons around the nuclei. And then there's a spin angular momentum, which is the, you know, the electron spinning uh, uh, like, uh, like this. And then um, in order to see uh, how big is this uh, you know, uh, magnetic moment is, we can do a simple uh, calculation. Because this is very uh, instructive, I just tried to uh, give you uh, how to do this. So uh, what we call the Bohr magneton is like uh, you have uh, the magnetic dipole moment uh, given as a the product of current and the area uh, uh, of the circuit, okay? So here the current, uh, the area of the circuit is EG pi A0 squared. So A0 is the Bohr radius, pi A0 squared is this, this area. And then current is two pi A0 uh, divided by V. So V divided by two pi A0 gives you how many times uh, electrons can orbit around uh, per unit time, right? Because V is the speed of an electron, two pi A zero is the circumference. So if you divide V by two pi A zero, that gives you how many times electrons orbit in a unit time. And if you multiply E, uh, which is the uh, elementary charge, uh, you can get uh, the current of this uh, due to this electron orbiting motion. And then uh, another thing is that uh, you, can, you can basically convert this V, the, the electron uh, uh, speed to a momentum. There's you know, MV is basically a momentum. And then there is a e, uh, convenient relation uh, uh, for the de, de Broglie uh, wave. So that uh, you know, if a particle have a momentum like this and it, it, you know, its uh, wavelength is about this, okay? So if, so this is your wavelength 
and then uh, and then we have a quantization condition so that like in order to not losing energy for the circling, uh, the circumference must be uh, equal to a uh, integer multiple of the wavelengths so that you can basically have a constructive interference per every orbit. Okay, so that's basically a condition like quantization condition. If you don't understand this, it's it's not too important, but you can kind of get some sense like, you know, um, uh, particles are actually uh, also a wave. And then uh, in order to convert, get the uh, wavelength of a particle, you, you can have this, uh, you can use this relation. And then this quantization condition is nothing but a uh, um, constructive interference condition. And then, and then that gives you this, okay? So with this, uh, conditions applied, then you can get your uh, magnetic uh, dipole moment can be reduced like this, okay? And then uh, we can also rewrite it uh, in, in using this way. So uh, like, like, like in this way, so using E here, and then, and then you use A0, and then you divide it by A0, uh, and then this entire thing, this entire thing becomes alpha, which is called a fine structure constant. Okay, so what does this tell you? Um, you should focus on the final result here. Magnetic dipole moment is equal to alpha divided by two, two times EA0. So what's the EA0? EA0 is like, uh, is the electric dipole moment due to the same system. So nucleus uh, having uh, positive uh, charge and electron have negative charge. Then, and the distance between these are A, then the electric dipole moment is of course EA zero, right? So what this tells you is that the relative uh, uh, intensity or relative strength of a magnetic dipole moment compared to the electric dipole moment is alpha divided by two, okay? And this alpha, which is called fine structure constant, has the value of one over 137, okay? So that's kind of a known number, okay? It's kind of uh, determined by elementary, uh, um, elementary uh, uh, constants, okay? And because of this, for a given system, for a given atom, electric moment tends to be at least two orders of magnitude larger than magnetic moment. And that's why uh, mu is one for most of the materials, because it's, you know, its magnetic response are naturally much weaker then it's electric response because you know fine structure constant is small, and then why fine fine, fine structure constant is small? Well, that's you know how the nature uh, looks like. Okay, so what what I the, the reason why I'm telling you this is is to tell you uh, it is actually difficult to induce magnetic response in in natural materials. So how can we overcome this? Well, one way to do it is to think about, uh, you know, because because uh, elect, you know, the natural uh, magnetic response uh, can be induced by orbiting atoms around the uh, nuclei, nucleus. So we can do a similar thing. Instead of orbiting electrons, we can probably have a circular metallic ring, so that. Uh, chart, you know, a uh, current can flow through it. And if this uh, current is flowing through this uh, metallic ring, then of course we have a magnetic moment uh, that is pointing towards you, right? So this is basic kind of most intuitive design for uh, magnetic response, artificial magnetic response. Okay, so, and, and this, this is gonna work. Right, although uh, it's you know uh, here, but but there are a few uh, important thing to note is that 
uh, if you have a this sort of a ring, then it's like um, you have an inductor, right? So this ring uh, have an, so if you if you want to increase the magnetic flux through this ring, then this ring creates the current by itself by electromagnetic induction to resist the change, and and that's the that's what inductor does, right? So here. Uh, as I said, uh, if you have a ring, this, the response of the ring must be diamagnetic. What I mean by this is the induced magnetic flux uh, opposed the change in the external flux by Lenz law, right? So because we have a ring and then this ring have, uh, is inductive so that it always wants to suppress the, uh, uh, you know, the, the change of the uh, magnetic flux. So that it's diamagnetic. All right. So if you have a ring, then uh, effective uh, per permeability must be smaller than one. Right. And then uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. And then also this is purely inductive, so that there's no resonance we we, we can uh, induce with this technique. Right. But we want more than that, right? We want more dynamic, uh, dynamic response. And sometimes we want to induce some resonance in order to maximize the magnetic response. Or sometimes we want to want our magnetic response to be opposite direction, not simply always diamagnetic, but we want our magnetic uh, response to be some, sometimes uh, paramagnetic. And how can we do this? How can we induce uh, resonance? You can simply, uh, you can make a very small change in, in order to induce resonance. So, uh, and, and it's more uh, obvious uh, if you think in this way, the equivalent circuit. So right now you have only a uh, inductor, right? And then in order to have a resonance, what you need is capacitor, right? So then you have LC resonance at a resonance frequency of, that's one over LC, or anyway, it's something like this. So, so that, uh, because, you know, uh, one tries to uh, make a delay and the other tries to make an advance so that if you have an LC circuit, you have a resonance. So what you want to do is to create some capacitance here. How can you do it? You can, simply erase some portion of ring, okay? Then uh, it's like this part acts like an inductor, but at the end, it must be uh, capacitive. Although this, you know, the capacitance is of course determined by the, this, you know, the, this, uh, this area. So if you want to increase the capacitance, you probably have need to have this type of uh, structure, right? But anyway, that's the key. You just, you just want to split the, split the ring. And then if you split the ring, then uh, you can have a uh, resonance, right? So this way uh, you can induce strong uh, LC resonance. And then uh, if omega, the frequency is far from, so like, like this, if your omega is far from the resonance frequency, then magnetic response will be pretty weak because it's far from the resonance. But near the resonance, the, it, it's going to be very, very strong. And, and one, one more interesting thing is that depending on which side uh, of the resonance you are at, uh, your response can be paramagnetic to diamagnetic, right? So if you think about the condition, you know, the, how the resonance work, if this is your resonance frequency, then if you're on, on this side, everything, uh, so it's like, this is the amplitude, but the phase is like this, right? This, I'm sorry, uh, the other way around, zero to pi, right? So that if you are, 
far from the resonance, nothing pretty much happened. But if you're close to the resonance, but smaller than the resonance frequency, then you have a very strong diamagnetic response. And then if you're on the other side, uh, close to the LC, but slightly larger than that, then you can have a strong paramagnetic response. Oh, okay, is it the other way around? And anyway, it, you see what I'm talking about. So, uh, so, so, so that you can uh, achieve like both regime depending on the frequency and, and also the negative if effective index can be achieved. But here's, uh, you know, here uh, is also, a pro we, we still have a problem because in this case, we are not only, uh, we are not only engineering uh, mu, but also uh, the electric response epsilon is, is also uh, um, of, get affected because you have a plus and minus here. It's basically, if you have a capacitance, then electric, uh, and then and then this capacitance uh, gives you a electric dipole, right? And then this electric dipole uh, oscillates as you as your uh, current oscillates, so that this one not, not only creates uh, electric uh, magnetic dipole but also electric dipole, right? But what we want to do is to kind of separate electric response from magnetic response. And how can you achieve that? How can you make your uh, electric, your, your uh, beta, so this is called beta atom, beta atom, so that it only has a magnetic response, not a electric response. So the key is uh, you have another, another P, uh, another electric dipole that is going to the opposite way so that electric dipoles cancel each other out, whereas magnetic dipoles are basically uh, uh, enhance each other out. And that structure can be created, oh, by the way, uh, before then, uh, this is the actual uh, electromagnetic response of this split ring. And you can see here, electric fields are focused in the capacitance, capacitive regime, and the magnetic response uh, is, you know, created due to the ring. You can see here this clear difference between e, uh, e field and H field. In order to remove uh, effective electrical response, you can come up with this. Okay, so if you do so, then uh, electric dipoles are cancelled. Two electric dipoles are basically cancelled each other out, so that the electric response of this guy becomes negligible. Whereas magnetic response are kind of uh, um, added. So you have a stronger magnetic response. And this is called a uh, double split, split ring resonator and first uh, suggested by uh, this famous Sir John Pendry uh, at uh, UK. And, and this, he is kind of a father of, uh, Beta materials and did many many important uh, works uh, in the field, and this is one of the uh, you know the, one of his signature work. Come up with this uh, artificial magnetic response, and here only magnetic moments dominate. So you can uh, you can do a interesting. Uh, you you basically have an um, independent engineering of the electric mode, electric. Uh, properties and magnetic properties. And this has been experimentally demonstrated uh, in 2001, also by uh, David Smith at, I guess, Purdue at that time. I don't know, a Duke. I, I, anyway, some, some uh, university like that. And uh, the first demonstration was done in, uh, done in gigahertz frequencies. So in a gigahertz frequencies, uh, the wavelength is about a few centimeters. So, and then the device size is about a few millimeters. So it's far sub wavelength. And then you can, uh, you know, this negative refraction and, and uh, the, the properties are, has been demonstrated here. And then uh, also uh, in 
terahertz frequencies. So terahertz means the, the wavelength is about uh, one millimeter or slightly smaller, shorter than that. And then device size of a, is about tens of micrometers. So again, uh, still uh, very, very small, like a far sub wavelengths. And then you can here see uh, the permittivity, uh, permeability has this resonant shape and this resonance uh, occurred at the LC condition, okay? The, the problem is, uh, you know, of course people want to do the same thing at much, much higher frequencies, like uh, say visible frequency, right? So then all we need to do is to just making the structure smaller. Uh, the problem is it's not the case because uh, if at the optical frequencies, the problem is metals cannot be modeled as a perfect conductor. So what I mean by perfect conductor means uh, electrons are, sorry. So if it's a perfect conductor, then electrons are moving uh, with a uh, oscillating electro electric field without any delay, right? So that's the perfect conductor. But the problem is uh, in, in optical frequencies, because electrons cannot follow uh, the speed of oscillating electromagnetic wave. So there is a lag delay between the uh, driving force and the electric uh, electron motion. And this is called kinetic inductance, okay? And because of this kinetic inductance, which is uh, proportional to one over A, if you think about the resonance condition, which is one over, one over LC squared, uh, uh, one over square root of LC, uh, here L is bounded. Uh, by, by this number, okay? And then because of that, the resonance condition, uh, the resonance frequency cannot go uh, uh, indefinitely higher because, because of this A squared thing. Okay, A, I, okay, A squared plus the constant factor. So because of that, uh, bec due to this factor, the, uh, the basically the electric, uh, the, the kinetic inductance of an electron, uh, the resonance frequency of a small uh, split ring resonator cannot indefinitely uh, 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 increases so that it's very difficult to obtain uh, the same re response, the same uh, electromagnetic response in the visible frequencies. So people came up with different structures. Like instead of uh, having a split rings, they came up with uh, simpler, uh, but like uh, more effective structures. And as you can see here, they come up with a two, basically two bars close to each other. Or, and then in the top view, these two bars are, are like uh, placed like this. And, and by doing, you know, these sort of an engineering, they were able to obtain a negative refraction uh, even in the uh, near infrared and also in the visible frequencies. But still, uh, it's not you know, uh, it's not as easy uh, as in the longer frequencies, longer wavelengths it's like a terahertz, gigahertz. In these frequencies, uh, metals are almost perfect so that we don't need to worry about the kinetic inductance. So everything just scales uh, with, uh, without any um, adjustment. But here, if you want to go to an optical frequency, then metals no longer perfect. And that creates this all sorts of problem. And also metals becomes more lossy so that uh, the metamaterials in the higher frequencies be, uh, is, is very lossy, okay? So um, yeah, and then, and then people also came up with this idea, like many, many, many different uh, forms of 
uh, metamaterials, and one of them are fishnet structure. And, uh, you know, uh, so if you have a uh, electromagnetic wave uh, that is uh, basically, if you have an electromagnetic wave that is uh, polarized in this way and the magnetic field in that way, then, you know, if you have a fishnet structure, then one of the bars actually are active for the magnetic wave. And the other bars, like the bars along the electric field are uh, active for the electric uh, field. So that if you have a fishnet, uh, they are both active in mag um, magnetic and electric field so that you can achieve a, a negative refraction here too. But uh, the people, uh, when this uh, idea of negative refraction first appeared, people were very, um, excited because you can also do a perfect lens uh, by using a uh, negative index materials. So uh, here's you compare uh, the, uh, you know, uh, what's happening uh, in the typical imaging system. So if you have an imaging system like a lens, you have a far field propagating. And then this lens can focus far field at the focal point. So the far fields are fine. Propagating waves are fine. The problem is uh, in order to uh, uh, retrieve the uh, perfect image, we also need the information of an evanescent wave. So what I mean by evanescent wave is that the wave is exponentially decaying as you move away from the uh, object, okay? And this evanescent wave cannot be uh, focused by a typical lens, right? Because it's just keep uh, exponentially decaying. And then what Pendry pointed out here, this paper also, I guess, was cited by uh, more than 5,000 times. And then what he found out that the propagating waves, if you have a negative index material, then the n equals one and n minus n equals minus one, if you think about the Snell's law, if, you, if your beam is incident upon like this, and then, and then it's going to be transmitted like this, right? And also at the, this boundary, same thing happens. This beam has no problem. And that beam going this way, so the same focusing effect we can achieve, okay, for the far field. And for the near field, evanescent wave, uh, what, what's strange is that uh, if you remember what's happening uh, here, the evanescent wave says uh, exponential of, you know, uh, this n uh, gamma, uh, say z, for instance, if this is z direction. So it's, it's gonna uh, exponentially decay. But the problem is, strange thing is, if you have index that is negative, then this term becomes positive. So that exponential, uh, the, the evanescent waves are actually exponentially increases. Uh, as you know, within this material. And then uh, after you go to a regular material again, then it's gonna decrease again exponentially. So that uh, the evanescent waves, you can also retrieve the evanescent wave uh, by using a negative index material. And that's the key point. If you, then you can collect all the information without missing anything so that you can have a perfect, you can create a perfect lens. And that, that was his, uh, John Pendry's uh, uh, theoretical prediction. And that's why people got very excited about the negative effective index materials, okay? And then you may ask, you may want to uh, ask, okay, if the negative index material can uh, amplify basically the, um, what is this, the, the evanescent wave, then doesn't it break the energy conservation law, right? Because it's like, if you go to 
a uh, if, if you have a negative index material, then it seems like energy is actually growing within the material. And isn't isn't that have any problem with energy conservation? And uh, if you read this paper, uh, John Pendy also pay uh, you know a lot of attention on, on that topic, and then he concluded that there's no problem. And then. Long story short, the, the reason he think there's no problem of doing that is because evanescent wave do not convey any energy, right? Because evanescent wave, although it exists, it does not uh, uh, involve any uh, energy flux along this direction. So even though it's increased, uh, there's no problem in terms of energy conservation. That's, that was his conclusion. Okay, and another interesting application about the uh, about the metal materials or negative index materials is uh, transformation optics, and this transformation optics is also what John Pendry uh, uh, first proposed in two thousand six, and the idea is simple: uh, you have Maxwell's equations like this, right, and then. Uh, if you think about an arbitrary coordinate transform between x, y, z to x prime, y prime, z prime, then uh, what you can do is uh, Maxwell's equation remains exactly same, exactly same form with the following set of transformations. So what, what, what does that mean is that you can effectively mimic coordinate transformation by uh, by using a spatially varying permittivity and permeability tensors. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? Uh, if you look at this, so uh, what we want to do is so let's say this is the original uh, original uh, space, and then this is the uh, the space that we want to transform to. Okay, so here you can see. Uh, R equals zero. So the zero point is blow up to a hollow region here, here. So zero point blow up to here. And, and this one remains the same. And the in-between these two is gonna be uh, contracted. Uh, and, and squeeze to, to this region, okay? And that coordinate transformation can be written like this, right? So theta and Z has nothing to do with this, right? And only R, so this is the new coordinate axis and then R is the original coordinate axis. So if R was zero, the origin becomes A in, in, in primed coordinate, right? And then, uh, and then if R was B, then you will realize that R prime is also B. So in between, it's like, you know, in between. So what's interesting thing about this is that, you know, uh, the inside of this, there's no connection to the real space, right? Because it's, it's nothing, it's, there's no mapping exists from this, and, and here, right? So uh, if we place something here, then it acts like as if there's, you know, this, is, this doesn't exist. So, okay. And if you have a, first that you have a um, coordinate transformation like this, and then if you apply this uh, relation, you know, this uh, transformation, then you realize that if we have a epsilon tensor, like epsilon and mu tensor, epsilon r, mu r, epsilon theta, mu theta, having these values, then we can create these type of a behavior. So what does that mean? It's like this. So if we have a permittivity and permeability, that satisfies uh, these conditions, so spatially varying permittivity and permeability, then the light uh, propagates as if uh, the space itself has been transformed, okay? And then the interesting thing is that 
the you know the boundary, the outer boundary is actually mapped to the original out, outer boundary. So that uh, if you look, if you want to see the light from here, so here let's say you have a, a light bulb, and then and then here's the light, and then you want to look at the situation here. You can cannot tell the difference, like this case and the case with a regular cylinder with no hollow inside, and the permittivity is just a, a constant value, right? So this case and that case are exactly same, e equivalent. So that, uh, and, and because it's it's about the coordinate transformation, it doesn't matter where your light source located. It, it, even though you have a, a point source, these light rays will circumvent this internal uh, uh, hollow and then propagate as if there's no nothing nothing here. Okay, so if you place something here, then it's cloaked, it's invisible from outside because it, no light uh, can actually penetrate to in, uh, inside. So. They demonstrated uh, this uh, by uh, using a metamaterials because now we have ability to control permittivity and permeability as we want. So uh, we created, uh, they created like a metamaterial clock. They, they can work uh, in, I guess, in uh, microwave frequencies. So these regions correspond to here and that region correspond to there. And as you can see, uh, yeah, so here you can see the experiment without clock. So you just have an internal regime, okay? Then you can see your, your wave front is significantly perturbed. So here, in here, the electromagnetic wave is much weaker than the electromagnetic wave in this region. region. So that if you measure, uh, if you are seeing this, this electromagnetic wave from that side, then you can immediately tell that, okay, there was something here, right? Because it's, it's weaker, so you can immediately notice. But uh, if you have an electromagnetic uh, clock, then you can see here the, your wave front, although it's a little bit perturbed, but you can see uh, it's it's very similar to the case where there is no uh, object in between, right? So that if you look at look from here, you cannot tell uh, whether there was an object here or not, right? So that's the uh, uh, that was a very hot topic actually in two thousand six, and then I was I I entered. Uh, graduate school in 2007. So when I entered uh, graduate school, this was a really, really hot topic and everyone talked about this. Uh, and then now uh, it's, you know, it's not as hot as uh, that time because the, the, the biggest problem is, is loss basically. I mean, it's a nice demonstration at uh, microwave frequencies, but uh, if you want to do the same thing in a visible frequencies or um, like, infrared, the metamaterials becomes too lossy uh, to do any of these techniques. And also uh, in media infrared and uh, infrared and uh, visible frequency, it is difficult to create 3D structure, 3D nanostructures like this. So because of these uh, practical reasons, you know, people uh, nowadays, they are not too much interested in, in this thing, as far as I know. Okay, so here too, like uh, people also try to show uh, whether this, you know, optical clocking is possible and uh, show some uh, simula nice simulation results. So at that time, these were very interesting. Here, you can see 2007, people try to uh, demonstrate the same thing in the uh, visual frequencies and there were some success, but it's not as practical as we originally thought. Okay, so this is one storyline uh, about the metamaterials. 